Yes. Um, the next panel is going to go until about 1230. Looks like there's lunch upstairs for the panelists and participants. Um, uh, Norman, you should know that quoting Justice Powell in this building is never a bad idea. <laughs> I'm fond of quoting Justice Powell here, or uh, are alone. Um, and uh, Dean Deanminer is going to moderate the next panel. Thank you. Well, good morning again, and welcome to the second morning panel, which is entitled "New Cases and New Tactics: uh, Approaching Gideon Through a Modern Lens." And our um, first two panelists will be focusing on the new cases part um, of the title. Uh, by using Lafleur and Fry and Padilla as starting points of their discussion. And the second set of papers, I guess, um, fits into the new tactics category, which means here the evaluation of counsel as well as looking at the financial threshold uh, for indigent defense. Now, Josh Bowers will start us off with a provocative discussion of the distinction between the right to counsel at trial and at plea bargaining. Now, plea bargaining and representation at trial, not surprisingly, uh, require different skill sets uh, and different approaches to substantive law. While the latter focuses perhaps on accuracy, but surely on formal rights, the, 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 the latter, the former, um, ideally considers fairness, um, and fairness perhaps even beyond the criminal justice sanction. Now, Josh claims in his a uh, little introductory paragraph that his paper is too speculative and messy. I have to admit I'm much more inclined to subscribe to the second part of his description of his paper, in which he calls it hopefully engaging and not all wrong. I thought you were going to say the messy part was the part that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Josh is a faculty member at the University of uh, Virginia's Law School, which he joined from a teaching fellowship at the University of Chicago. Now, in addition to his academic interest in criminal law and procedure and criminal justice, he has deep practice experience, first as a white-collar criminal defense lawyer and then as a lawyer for the Bronx Defenders. It is these experiences that have shaped his interest in on-the-ground enforcement and institutional incentives that inform the decisions of the actors in the criminal justice system. Assuming that technology will continue to favor us, Josh will be followed by Professor Margaret Etienne, who will be Skyping in from the University of Illinois, where she is the Nancy Snowden Research <coughs> Scholar in Law and the Academic Dean at the University of Illinois. Those of you who have been or are currently academic deans will surely appreciate the effort Margaret is making um, in making a contribution to the symposium and in joining us um, today. Um, Margaret served as a state and federal public defender after graduating from Yale Law School and serving as a federal clerk. Margaret also starts with Lafleur and Fry, uh, which she acknowledges uh, for extending the right to counsel in the plea context. But she will then focus on the challenges of these decisions uh, with a special emphasis on sentencing-related matters. After her, we will hear a joint presentation uh, by Ron Wright and Ralph Peoples from Wake Forest. Starting with Moneyball, they have put together a fascinating paper on how to assess the quality of criminal defense lawyering by looking at sentencing outcomes. Um, I think they believe that anecdotal observation akin to rate my professor or rate my criminal defense lawyer um, should at least be <laughs> supplemented, uh, perhaps even replaced with meaningful measures of attorney performance. They don't restrict their argument, as it's not uncommon for them, not to the theoretical, uh, but instead applied to rate criminal defense lawyers um, in North Carolina. Uh, I should add there's a big caveat at the end of their piece about this is not for use by the non-trained, I guess. Um, it gives me special pride uh, to introduce Ron Wright um, as I am his co-author, and I want it to be said this way, um, on his sentencing casebook, uh, which he manages in addition to his amazing casebook um, on criminal procedure. Now, you all know Ron as one of the country's best known and most productive criminal justice scholars uh, who often uses empirical methods, especially in his work um, on prosecutors. Uh, I think we can also all agree that he's one of the nicest people uh, we all know. Ron was a DOJ trial attorney before joining the um, faculty at Wake Forest. Um, he sits on various boards nationally 
and in North Carolina of organizations that include the Vera Institute of Justice and the North Carolina Prisoner uh, Legal Services. As Ron's interest in the subject matter is infectious, uh, you may not be surprised uh, that he pulled somebody into uh, the fold who really um, has nothing to do uh, with criminal justice, or at least so he thought until now. Uh, his co-author on this piece um, is Ralph Peoples, a fellow faculty member um, at Wake Forest. Now, Ralph has had a very distinguished academic career uh, with his focus um, on civil disputes, ADR, and negotiations. Now, obviously, Ron and he share two, two sets of interests. One is negotiations, or as we like to call it, uh, plea bargaining, and in empirical uh, methods, which Ralph has employed to evaluate court-ordered mediation in child custody outcomes as well as in medical malpractice cases. Think we are all delighted to have a non-criminal justice academic, or in short form, a non-criminal among us today. Last but surely not least, uh, we have with us John Gross, who is Indigent Defense Counsel at NACTL. Now John has had already a distinguished career as a public defender in New York City and as a criminal clinician at Syracuse's law school before he decided to join NACTL. At NACTL, he devises legislative and litigation strategies and works closely with other organizations to enhance the criminal justice system. Now John will bring us back to a vexing question about Gideon. Who is poor enough to get court-appointed counsel? What measurements should we employ to assess indigency? In light of the cost of legal counsel today, is the term indigency perhaps misleading and too lauded from the start? These are truly four exciting papers and Josh will start us off with a discussion of his. Thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you, JD. Thank you, organizers of this conference. I, I feel really privileged uh, to be here uh, uh, amongst so many people that I, I not only admire, but in some cases, people like uh, Robin Steinberg, my former boss, who's also a personal hero of mine, people like Stephanos Bebas and Ron Wright, who, um, you know, when I made the transition from being a public defender to being an academic, were extremely um, generous and um, uh, uh, constructive and helpful. I really consider them to be mentors of mine. And, you know, people like um, Sasha and Erica and Jenny, who are writing about misdemeanors, which I've always felt is just an overlooked uh, a, a, a facet of the criminal justice system and a very large facet of the criminal justice system. Uh, the dean already pointed out, out that I, I'm, somewhat I'm being somewhat apologetic about my draft, but I really mean it. I think it's a little bit too scattered and sloppy, and I, I really intended that to be as much a message to the reader as to the law review editors. Please uh, know that I will make it more, uh, I'll make it tighter and more coherent by the time I get in the final draft. Um, I, I, what I hope you have in front of you, though, gives you a sense of where I'm going. And uh, the, the seeds of my essay, I think it can be traced back to my experiences as a public defender in Bronx Criminal Court, where I worked as a staff attorney, as I said, at Bronx Defenders. Uh, in the Bronx, I was struck almost immediately by how little the practice of criminal defense had to do with the substantive criminal law. So there's an old adage that, um, it's probably a tired adage, that many of you have heard that a, a good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge. In the Bronx, I think it was fair to say that a great lawyer knew the law, the judges, the prosecutors, the court officers, the location of the back steps to get quickly from the first floor to the third floor, uh, the elevators that are always slow or broken and to be avoided, any of the many courthouse norms, customs, and quirks. Uh, a great lawyer also practiced with attitude and persuasion. A great lawyer knew the going plea rates and what constitutes a strong equitable argument independent of law to get an even better deal. And most importantly, a great lawyer knew her or knows her client, uh, her client's needs, her client's objectives, which again is something, it's an inquiry that has something to do with the law, but not everything to do with the shape and the substance of the law. For too long, however, my position is that the Supreme Court has turned a blind eye to the realities of practice. For too long, uh, the Constitution has failed to accommodate practice that occurs beyond law, uh, which I think is to say most of practice. When it comes to the aspects of lawyering that matter most to most cases, uh, the Court and the Constitution has stood on the sidelines, at least up until recently. 
It's relegated such matters at most to the domain of professional ethics. Of course, I, I think the court's understanding is that it would be somewhat messy um, uh, 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 to get involved, to get too deeply involved in questions of practice, but the mere fact that it is messy doesn't make it any less critical. At least at some level, it is critical. I think the court is slowly beginning to understand this, um, uh, slowly, sub 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 subtly, but surely, uh, specifically in Padilla v. Kentucky, Lafleur v. Cooper, and Missouri v. Fry, the court has come to understand that conventional criminal justice is a system that does not rely primarily on trials or exclusively on substantive law. To the contrary, the criminal justice system is, as the court recognized in Lafleur, a system of pleas and plea bargains. This is an unfortunate reality. I'm not celebrating this fact, but it is the reality. And the right to counsel uh, it, it may translate into uh, not much in the way of constitutional meaningfulness if this principal practice, that is plea bargaining, is walled off from constitutional regulation. <coughs> now, the court has long recognized uh, that a defendant has a right to assist, uh, uh, effective assistance of counsel at his or her guilty plea and even the negotiations and discussions that lead up to that guilty plea. But only recently has the court begun to comprehend that the right to effective assistance of counsel at a uh, plea bargain has to mean something different than the right to effective assistance of counsel at trial. Uh, in other words, doctrine constructed to promote the right to counsel at trial is a poor fit uh, in the context of the plea bargain. Simply, trials and pleas ask different questions, and the defense attorney does different work at the stages, of the distinct stages of bargain and trial. Trials are, and I think ultimately should be, about guilt accuracy. That is, whether a defendant is or is not legally guilty. Sure, a great lawyer tries to sneak in uh, equitable arguments and plant the seeds of nullification, and they wouldn't be doing their job if they didn't do those things. But at the bottom, the, a, a, the bottom line question in a trial is a decidedly uh, a, a scientific question, a question of legal science. Has the state demonstrated legal proof beyond a reasonable doubt? It's a formalistic, legalistic inquiry. Comparatively, plea bargains are and ultimately I think should be, if there's one good thing we can say about them, about more than legal guilt, about more than accuracy, legal guilt accuracy. They're about, or they should be about discretion. They should be about fairness. They're of course also about the prosecutor's perspective on what constitutes efficient and optimal crime control. These considerations and many others uh, uh, overlap with legal questions without a doubt, but they sometimes may run counter to it. And it's not a perfect mesh in any event. It depends on the case. Often enough, plea bargaining uh, is a mechanism for all the parties, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, uh, the judge, to find a way out from under the unwelcome strictures of mandatory legislative command. Things like mandatory minimum sentences, mandatory immigration consequences, and other enmeshed penalties. That is to say, plea bargaining can be a tool to circumvent the law. And it's my position that there ought to be tools to circumvent the law. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Sasha talked some this morning about accuracy, and Robin said yesterday, um, damn you, Gideon. I mean, I, I'll try to be equally provocative by saying, damn you, accuracy. Uh, I, I, I like accuracy. Accuracy is fine. But, you know, I don't like inaccuracy, but I don't like it as a unitary focus. And I think there's been an under-attention to <laughs> fairness, um, particularly fairness notwithstanding law. Um, and so what I, what I think I find so startling and refreshing about cases like Padilla and Lafleur and Fry, and I have plenty of bad things to say about these cases as well, but what I, what I like about them is that it seems that the court has come around to this position too. Specifically in Padilla, the court talks about uh, creative plea bargainings, creative, uh, designed to end run mandatory, uh, uh, what's sometimes called collateral consequences or in mesh penalties, pick your, your, your term. Uh, the court has talked about the prejudice of the lost opportunity for even a legally guilty defendant to get out from under legally supported charges. That's from Lafler. 
It's talked about local as opposed to uh, legislative conceptions of what constitutes sound, their language, sound administration of criminal justice, the local perspective. In a second best world, where we refuse judicially or politically to do what I think need, which ought to be done, we, we refuse to do anything about our runaway substantive codes, we need procedural tools like this to mitigate the harshest effects of substantive code law. We need lawyers who will fight hard and are constitutionally obligated to convince prosecutors not to follow the law. We need lawyers who are, uh, 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 try to circumvent the law. Ultimately, however, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be starry-eyed about this. I, I think that there, there's a complication here. There's a complicated interplay between this process of circumvention and plea bargaining as a tool to circumvent, an interplay between plea bargaining and our draconian substantive codes. First, uh, prosecutors, as we've talked about already, rely upon draconian statutes to, uh, 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 to, to derive plea bargaining leverage. That's the source of their plea bargaining leverage. Indeed, even the Fry Court acknowledged this fact, saying that many longer sentences exist on the books largely for bargaining purposes. So draconian sentences promote, they produce more plea bargaining. But the parties use plea bargaining as a way to end run, to get around these draconian statutes. They use plea bargaining to promote local conceptions of substantively appropriate punishment. Uh, now, I, I think what is so uh, uh, remarkable about the court's recent, the recent decisions is that it's come to understand that a defendant may suffer a cognizable constitutional injury where he is represented by ta defense counsel who leaves him to the wolves, where the wolves are the law itself, where the lawyer does not fight hard to get them out from under the law. Um, that is where the defense counsel's bargaining errors cause her client, in the words of the Laffler court, to lose benefits the defendant would otherwise have received in the ordinary course. The ordinary course, that's the measure of appropriate punishment, not what the law prescribes. So with Gideon now reaching the ripe old age of 50, I hope we're beginning to discover, to discover that there are in fact two rights to counsel, and there ought to be two rights to constitutional counsel, a uh, right to bargaining counsel and a right to trial counsel. Uh, the right to trial counsel is a right against state coercion, or at least state coercion in advance of an accurate adjudication of guilt. It is a right to, uh, to representation within the law. But the right to bargaining counsel is a right to representation beyond law. It is a right to a lawyer who, who will provide information and advice about the most attractive way out of the law. It is a right to a lawyer who will fight for the most attractive way out of the law. Um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about one of the oddest uh, 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 plea bargains that I ever reached, uh, which was on the advice of uh, a good friend of mine, former immigration attorney at the Bronx Defenders, uh, 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 Peter Markowitz, who currently teaches at um, Cardozo. And uh, Peter and I, uh, I, I had a client who was facing a non-criminal, a violation charge of harassment. And he was, uh, uh, he was an undocumented uh, immigrant. And Peter told me, you know, if he takes a plea to the violation, he's going to be subject to deportation. If, however, he takes a plea to the nonsense charge of uh, misdemeanor reckless assault, he won't be deportable. Uh, and so we pled up. He was not charged with a crime, but we got the prosecutor to agree to charge him with a misdemeanor so that we could plead to this ridiculous thing, which the judge accepted because we all knew that what we were trying to do was keep this person in the country so he could continue to work hard and support his family and he wouldn't be subject to the undesirable strictures of mandatory federal law. So. What we were doing there is what I call the bargaining right to counsel. And I'm glad that the court is finally recognizing that there's a constitutional obligation to do that kind of messy work in some capacity, at least as long 
as we refuse to do anything about our overblown substantive criminal code. So I've spoken for long enough. But thank you guys very much. So we'll turn to Margaret now. Microphone. We can hear you well. Oh, okay, great. Yes, and we can see you very nicely and hear you clearly. Okay. Well, I guess I want to start by, again, as, as Josh did and others have, to um, thank JD and Carney and all the organizers of the conference, as well as, um, as the dean, um, whose work I admire, and so it's really nice to have also moderating, moderating this. It's a, bit, it's a little bit bittersweet, I have to say, to see so many of my friends and colleagues having a great time in Lexington, and I'm stuck here in, in Champaign. Um, and of course, there are those of you whose, whose work I admire, and I haven't had a chance to meet, and so that's even a little bit harder. I should say, too, that, the, that you all have these very cool um, name tags that I'm... I'm I, I wish I had. They, they look from my vantage point like sort of blue ribbon winners or something that you all are, are wearing. Um, so let me just get started with, with my comments. And, I, and of course, I'm, I'm really grateful for modern technology that I'm able to, to do this. I was able to um, attend a good bit of the conference this morning by a live feed. So <laughs> that's fantastic. Thanks for, for, for that. I feel, I feel more like I'm part of the club now. Um, so, you know, obviously we're talking about Gideon, and 50 years after Gideon, I think that the, the theoretical commitment to the right to counsel remains strong, as, other, as others have said, but there really does seem to be a question about how that right to counsel plays out on the ground, um, how that right to counsel plays out in terms of the, abil the ability to uh, regulate what it is lawyers do, um, and how lawyers do it. So I want to focus um, sort of on Missouri versus Fry and its companion case of Laffler versus Cooper to talk a little bit about what I see as a trend in the sort of post-Gideon cases, and that is in particular the difficulty to administer the right to counsel, right? So that I think of the right to counsel in a sense, or at least the Gideon case in a sense, as being a regulatory tool. And I want to think about the cases that follow that in terms of how well they actually help to regulate what it is we think of as this right to a lawyer. Um, I think the public perception of the, that the accused has a fundamental right to counsel is entrenched in the American psyche um, and in, to some degree in the jurisprudence, but how we administer that right or how we enforce that right um, is a bit of a different story. So when I think about the right to counsel cases, we can think about them as being divided into two sets of, of categories, right? First, there are those cases like Gideon that establish the existence of the right in a particular context or in a new context. So, for example, the um, uh, Henry Galt, the juvenile case that establishes the fact that juveniles do have a right to counsel in disciplinary hearings or in, you know, when they're being adjudicated as, as juvenile delinquents is a kind of case that falls into the category of when does the right exist? What's the context in which somebody has that right versus the context in which the right isn't there at all? The second category, sort of when the right attaches, might be one way to think about that. And, and Miranda is a case like that, and Gideon is a case like that, um, in regards to the case like that, and there are a list of others. Now, the second category of right to counsel cases, I think, Maybe those are the ones in which the, the, the right is defined, the contours of the right are defined um, so that we can establish the right exists, but we have to think about um, what it means to actually be effective, what it means to have an effective attorney, not just when does the right exist. So since Gideon, state and federal courts have had to weigh in on what constitutes ineffective assistance 
in various contexts. And judges varied in their approaches as to what actually it means to be meaningful or effective. And so, of course, we have sort of Strickland essentially sets the, the, the standard um, for how we go about determining whether or not an attorney is effective in a particular context. So as you know, most of you all know, um, Strickland has its two parts. The first part really is talking more about um, examining the deficiency of the performance. Is the performance deficient? And then second, does it lead to adverse results? Is it prejudicial to the defendant in some way? So when we think about these two categories of cases, the second category of post-Gideon right to counsel cases, those that define what constitutes effective assistance far outnumber the first category of cases, those that establish the existence of the right. Now, when I think about these two categories, to sort of go back into thinking about them as regulatory tools, I think of the first category um, of those cases as, as tools that help other bodies, particularly police off, you know, help us regulate what law enforcement does, what prosecutors do, um, what uh, courts do, how they go about either um, infringing on that right. So Miranda, for example, tells us, you know, what it is that, that law enforcement have to do in order not to violate the right to counsel or to make sure that that right um, um, persists. The second category of cases, I think of cases that really deal with deal more with sort of self-regulation. Um, they look more sort of trying to regulate attorney conduct and allowing attorneys to self-regulate their own conduct. So sort of setting it up that way, I think it's in that context that I want to think about the sort of um, Fry and, and Laffler cases as cases that might be in that second category, that are in that second category, that might help lawyers think about what it is they ought to be doing um, to provide the best counsel that they can. So just to, the, now, the, now the Fry case, many of you know, in terms of just a, a quick review of the facts, right, the Fry case deals with the case where the attorney fails to provide any information about a plea offer. The plea offer expires, the defendant does in fact plead guilty, and receives a sentence much higher than he would have received um, had he been told about the offer. Now, you don't really need a Supreme Court, I think, to tell lawyers that the appropriate thing to do is to convey plea offers, to communicate with your client, and so forth. But I think that the, 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 the Lafler case, where the defendant in Cooper um, deals with a very kind of different situation, does have um, a lesson for, uh, for attorneys, and I want to talk about the implications of that lesson, um, both good and bad. So as far as the, the, the Lafler, are we okay? Robert, your audio is fine, the video is frozen. I can't hear you. The audio is fine, the video is frozen. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Um, I might minimize the screen and just let you talk, or we can do a reconnection or a telephone call. Let me tell oh, you. I, I can't hear you. All right, I'm going to text you. He's speaking to the microphone. Yeah, I think so. And maybe the Can you hear me from here? Hello? I'm going to reconnect. Okay, you're back. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Where, have, where did I? Where did I end? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I want to. I don't know how long this will this will last, so I want to get to the heart of what I'm talking about, um, which is really thinking about the Laffer versus Cooper case and how it's going to impact what it is lawyers do from here on out. So in Laffer versus Cooper, the underlying facts suggest that Cooper essentially fires several shots at a woman. Um, he's uh, charged, facing charges of um, several violent offenses, including assault with the intent to murder. Um, Cooper chases this woman. He manages to shoot her four times, hitting her in the hip, the abdomen, buttocks, 
um, among other places, he then confesses his guilt um, and his desire to plead guilty, but his lawyer persuades him that he has a viable trial defense. That is, the fact that he fails to shoot the victim above the waist shows that he didn't really intend to kill him, right? So a, a very kind of ludicrous, almost laughable suggestion, but nonetheless, Cooper rejects a, a guilty plea, a plea offer to four to seven years, and is sentenced following a trial to um, the mandatory minimum of 15 to 30 years, right? So in this particular case, what we have is a, a, a lawyer who provides arguably, I think more than arguably, really bad advice to a defendant, um, and the defendant relies on it and decides to go to trial. So Cooper is a case of bad facts, among other things. Now, there's an old adage, I know that, that Josh talked about a print adage, um, essentially good lawyers know the law, great lawyers know the judges. I think there's another adage that I want to talk about, which is this idea that um, bad cases make bad law, and good cases make good law. I'm not sure that this is at all true anymore in the criminal law context, because I think that often what lawyers do, what defense lawyers do, um, is they really try to push the envelope sometimes when they've got case, when they've got facts that are so bad, or the law that is so bad, that there's very little to lose um, by attempting to make arguments that you know, one might think are arguments that ought to be made in every case. So what cases like Lafler and Fry try to do, I think, is to set a normative standard for how lawyers ought to behave, um, and now particularly in the plea offer context. So Lafler teaches, in a sense, a risk aversion to bold defenses. Now, of course, Lafler's lawyer's defense is a bit of a joke. Right? It's a joke because the deal was so good and the, the, his view of the, the law was so faulty. But I guess I want to invite you to imagine a case that is not nearly stark. Right? Imagine a case where the offer that's on the table is better than going to trial or better than pleading blind, um, but not, not a great offer. And imagine a case where the lawyer really has a legal argument that they want to make that they think would be beneficial to either that particular defendant or to the state of the law generally, and they have an opportunity to make it in that particular context. So I think, for example, about a case that I had when I was in practice, and I recall a case where there was a 66-year-old defendant who was facing, this was a federal case, who was facing 10 years as an armed career criminal, um, would get out of prison probably close to the age of um, 76, um, maybe a little bit earlier, good time, um, and he found guilty pretty much dead to rights in possession of a gun during what was otherwise a minor drug deal, selling pot to um, a undercover uh, snitch. snitch. It was a bad case. The facts were bad. And in my view, the amount of time that he was facing was so significant, he was looking at a life sentence, essentially. Um, and I had very good arguments that I wanted to make um, at sentencing, but I would have had to, we would have had to have a, a sentencing, a, a plea waiver, an appeal waiver at sentencing, um, there were very good things that we could have talked about in terms of this undercover. Um, we could have made Eighth Amendment arguments, not great arguments, but, you know, you know, given his age. Now, this particular defendant decided to, go to, to, decided to take the plea because the very idea of never getting out of jail again and, and dying in prison was too much to bear. So, um, and as, you know, Jenny was saying earlier, you know, it's important to provide all the information, and the defendant made the choice that, that he thought was in his best interest. But if I had been able to persuade him to go to trial, um, and we lost, would this defendant have a claim of ineffective assistance, right? Having then eventually offered much a more favorable um, result. 
right? Clearly, and prejudice uh, under the new sort of view under uh, what constitutes prejudice under Strickland. Um, now, I don't think that most lawyers would be deterred by that. I think that what Lafleur is to sort of set up a different standard or a different thinking about what norms should be in terms of keeping the envelope when the results may actually, you know, not necessarily the promise of a good result. Now, I think that there's a good thing happening too with this new way of thinking of in this context, and this um, a new perhaps norm that lawyers as well. And I think it is a step forward. Um, particularly in light of thinking about for fairness or the you know, right to a counsel as a property for fairness, something that I was earlier, the right to an attorney is necessarily a proxy for But Lafler and and is it stuck about wait the Yes. I'm going to interrupt you and just reestablish the connection because the the audio is horrible. Okay. Okay, and if you could check and make sure you're not still listening to the live feed, and we'll be right back with you. Let's hear testing. Oh. Hello? That's nicer, thank you. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Sorry for the No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I, I guess I want to sort of move to a conclusion so that we can um, move along. But I think there's one more piece that is worth talking about here. And that is, it seems as if we are, and I, I agree very much with what Josh was saying earlier, that what is happening in part is that with this shift in how we think of um, as prejudice, to the client or what constitutes effective assistance, we're moving perhaps beyond a pure outcome determinative view, beyond purely sort of a procedural fairness. Um, so the courts now have said that uh, prejudice isn't going to merely be defined by the reliability of the conviction. Right? In Lafler and Fry, it's clear that they're guilty, that they wanted to plead guilty. Um, we're not talking about whether they, as the dissent argued, um, were reliably convicted, but whether there's something else that lawyers owe their clients that may be more qualitative, that may be more holistic in terms of holistic defense lawyering that you know we've heard about earlier, um, maybe in terms of impact lawyering, think about how what they're doing impacts the criminal defense process generally. Um, so I think that's a really good piece, and to the extent that we start to see a norm shift in terms of how lawyers themselves regulate their own behavior to think like beyond really quantitative outcomes, I think that there is something possibly very good happening in the self-regulatory sphere of um, cases like this. So I'm going to end, end there for uh, to questions and comments. start off just by acknowledging I am a lucky man because I'm in this beautiful place. It's beautiful indoors. It's beautiful outdoors. I'm in a room with people that I like, that I really enjoy exchanging views with, people who are smart and caring and making a difference. And we're talking about a subject that is profoundly important. All this puts together to make me a lucky man and a happy man. The only thing that would make me luckier and happier, I think, would be to be sitting in a baseball game. So I think, well, maybe I can push my luck and I can sort of combine this experience. And so we can talk about baseball while doing these other wonderful things. So my colleague Ralph and I are working on a, on a project dealing with uh, the measurement of the quality of defense counsel using ideas drawn from the book 
and movie Moneyball, I'll assume, just as I do in every class that I teach, I'll assume preparation. You've all, of course, watched the movie in preparation for this, uh, this talk, I, uh, I'm imagining. Let's see, I want this one. There we go. So Gideon, well, this is a conference about Gideon, and we need to start there. Gideon puts us in the business of measuring the quality of lawyers. Not logically necessary that that happens, but that's the world we're living in. And so Gideon has asked several different uh, uh, actors in the system to be thinking about the quality of lawyering that happens. Uh, at one level, judges get involved. Initially, Gideon is just about the, the presence of a lawyer. Just yes, no, is there a lawyer there? And you're not really asking about quality. But after a while, litigants push on that and they say, you know, there are certain systems where the, the resources are so abysmal and the, the overall uh, resources available to everyone are so unthinkably bad that, uh, that we don't truly have lawyers even present. So I call this the Gideon Plus litigation, and Kara Drynan and others have, have looked at this. This is one setting where judges are thinking, at least in gross terms, about, the, about measuring the quality of counsel. Uh, once you hit the world of Strickland and you start asking you know, if it's going to really be a lawyer there, it's got to be an effective lawyer, then you do start asking about the, the quality of the lawyering that's happening. I won't go into all the limits on the way we measure lawyering there. It's not especially focused very much on what happens for an individual lawyer, certainly not across that lawyer's entire portfolio of cases. It's not truly outcome driven. It's more about the boxes that the lawyer checks. But some form of, of quality measurement happens under Strickland. Uh, judges, when they appoint lawyers to cases, sometimes are making individualized judgments about at least the level of experience of the lawyer. So a local rule might say that you can only appoint someone to, a, to represent a defendant in a felony case if you have at least second chaired a prior felony, or you can only represent somebody in a murder case if you've second chaired at least one prior murder case. So there are some gross measures of, uh, of effectiveness there. The more interesting measures of effectiveness come when the managers of defense offices, the manager of a public defender service, or the manager of a law firm, the sort of leading lawyer who makes the assignments in a, in a law firm, gets involved in uh, evaluating the attorneys. Again, Gideon really presses this job in front of the defense lawyer. Uh, Gideon, in a world where Gideon is going to be underfunded, where there is this norm, this expectation established that the lawyer will be there and will do what lawyers normally do, but we're not going to give you the full budget to make that happen. You really have to economize. You really have to start thinking about how can I get the most for our limited money. That puts you in the business of evaluating, well, who's going to be the better attorney? Who's, so for instance, I have to start thinking about who am I going to assign to more serious cases? I have to start thinking, what's going to be my hiring strategy? Should I be hiring more people uh, who I can hire at a lower salary or fewer people at a higher salary? Uh, who should I promote? Who should I assign to special projects? That's an evaluative process. And the trouble with, for all of these actors is we have very little way of, of putting in, of, of really knowing how well the individual attorney is doing. Our information sources are quite thin, quite weak. So if it's really important, it's especially, it's, even though it's important in this setting, it's pretty hard in this setting to get the, the quality measurement done. Uh, if you say, why don't we you know, measure this person like we might in a lot of different you know, sales settings or a lot of different uh, you know, jobs, we put some kind of number on it. Can you put a number on this? And the shocked and appalled answer among many people who would be working in the system would say, oh, come on, this is a complex service. You can't put a number on lawyering. This is a very complicated service, and you just have to be there on the ground, and you have to watch it. And I understand that. It is a complex service, and you know, you're, you're being reductive when you place a number on it. You are definitely missing things. It's also especially challenging in criminal justice, where the data problems are so enormous. You know, anybody who's spent time lately in a criminal courtroom knows that you're dealing with ancient computers and they're puffing steam out the sides of them and they're crippled, you know, databases that are chugging along. And, you know, really you're going to get data out of that system and have something meaningful to say about the quality of lawyers. So it is a, it's a setting where there's a lot of data, lots and lots of cases churning through and you know a lot of things happening, but the quality of the information about any given case is troublesome. So these are real hurdles to get over. On the other hand, this kind of hurdle is 
cleared in other settings. So we have uh, numerical you know, metrics, quantitative metrics of quality for something as complex and important as healthcare. So hospitals are now being rated, not in a perfect way, but in an interesting and meaningful partial way based on the outcomes that they produce that are now available uh, through Medicare data that has been posted online. And that's how we start, we're starting to get these various ratings of, of hospitals. Uh, many of the same objections that we might make to rating lawyers individually, hospitals are raising about the rating of their complex services. Public school teachers, as you know, are very often in a battle about whether to uh, rate their performance based on the movement in the quality of their students' scores on testing. There are obviously problems with using that, uh, you know, relying too greatly on that, putting too heavy a, a percentage of the, uh, of the evaluation on that one score, and yet, you know, Chicago teachers and others are in the business of saying, okay, we'll do that. It's relevant. It's just we need to ma match it up with more individualized observation. The principal comes to the room and sees me as well as looking at the test scores of my students. So there's also, of course, baseball where the scouts are saying you can't just look at, you know, at the, uh, the on-base percentage or the slugging percentage of a hitter. You have to see how wonderful his swing is or what his arm strength is. And, you know, you can't tell based on just the numbers. But you can tell something based on the numbers. And if you combine the scouts' observations with the numerical observations, you may end up being a more effective selector and uh, an assigner of, uh, of talent. So that's the, the, those are the hurdles we have to clear, and that, that's uh, how other areas have handled this. So could we do this when we're evaluating defense attorneys? So Ralph and I have this idea that we would start with the thing that matters a lot to a lot of defendants. I won't say the most to every defendant, but it matters a lot to a lot of defendants, and that is the bottom line. What will my sentence be? Now, the data that we have is in felony world, so I understand misdemeanor land is a, is, creates different considerations. But in uh, the felony world, uh, we were able to get data from the North Carolina courts that told us in any given case uh, what was the starting point charge? The charge of arraignment, which was the charge that had been evaluated by the prosecutor before a defense attorney was meaningfully involved. So a starting point charge, North Carolina guidelines state, so we were able to pick the normal starting point there, which would be the bottom of what we call the presumptive range for that person with that particular crime and that particular person's criminal history record. So you could get not a perfect but a meaningful starting point sentence, and then we knew what sentence was actually imposed. And so, you know, if you start off at, a, let's say, 100, <coughs> just call it 100 punishment units. If you start off with a, in a case with 100 punishment units and it actually moves down to 60, then you could say that lawyer added 40 units of value. Uh, is that good or is that bad? Well, you answer that by comparing it to other attorneys around the state. So you might say, well, what did other attorneys do with that particular crime as the starting point, and where did their cases end up? And if it turns out that statewide, the normal movement there is 30, and this attorney moved you 40, then you say, good, you know, for defense purposes, moving 10 above the norm is what you're looking for. We could call that a positive. So uh, a plus 10. Can you compare breaking and enterings to assault with a deadly weapon or other crimes. You're going to get a lot more movement with some crimes than others. One way to handle that is just to normalize it all by using standard deviations. And I won't go into all the, uh, all the statistical background there, but basically standard deviations are just a way of, I think of it like, the, like a bicycle race. So like a, like a cycling race where there's this big pack of riders. They're all riding along together, the peloton. And then there's a trickle of riders out front and there's a trickle of riders out back. And the standard deviation just tells you if you're within one standard devi deviation, you're with the peloton. You're kind of within the normal range of things. Uh, if you're beyond one standard deviation, uh, then you're way out front or way out back. So in this case, if I'm 10 above average, let's say that the standard deviation for this particular crime is 15. So most of the riders in the cycling race fall somewhere between 45 and 15. So there's a 15 standard deviation. I've moved 10 up. I'm 10 to the good. So that makes me a, you know, a 0.67 or two-thirds of one standard deviation. So the general idea here is to figure out how much value you added on the sentence, compare it to other attorneys, and then use some 
statistical techniques to normalize that so you can compare across cases. Now, what kind of report would a manager get if you had these kind of scores for every case that's sentenced that's coming through the system? Oh, one, final, one thing before we move to that. You could go to a manager of an office and say, I know that, the, that this is not the only thing you care about. You might care about things other than how well the attorney is negotiating particular sentences. In that case, you might say, fine, we'll customize the rating for your office. 60% of the score will come from how, how much movement, you're, you know, what your value added is on the sentences. 20% of it might come from how many dismissals you get. 10% from this or that. I mean, you could come up with a composite uh, index that would try to reflect the range of things that matter for your office. So you could imagine a customized index. But with that in mind, imagine that every attorney's cases get scored, and then you could put it all together into a single score for that, for that, uh, for that defense attorney. What would it look like? The report might look like this. The... I, we changed the names to, to, Dickens, to, to, to make them more Dickensian. But other than that, these are real numbers. These are real numbers from North Carolina attorneys. And so if I'm a, a manager, I might think, you know, Eugene Rayburn, really worrying me. He's way at the back of the pack consistently. His median score across 16 different cases that are in the database this year is negative 2.63. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to fire Eugene Rayburn. It doesn't mean I'm going to dock his pay, but it might mean I've got a limited amount of time to observe attorneys. I think the next chance I get, I better go watch Eugene Rayburn. You know, I better be thinking about putting Rayburn into some kind of training or at least look a little bit more closely. What's going on there? On the other hand, I'm pretty happy with Agnes Wickfield. Uh, I'm pretty happy with Esther Summerson. Uh, the, more the, case, the more cases that are in my system, the more confident I am in that number. Lower numbers would make me less confident, so that might be a little asterisk beside uh, Eugene Rayburn. Is there aren't a lot of cases there yet. Maybe something weird was going on in just a couple of strange cases. But at any rate, imagine an, a, a manager of a defense, uh, a, a public defender office, getting a routine report like this. Or maybe the report looks like this. We'll break it down by crimes. How is our office doing on breaking and entering? And you might say, oh, you know, the state average is negative 105. That is, the sentences are going up by 105 units. And in our office, they're going up by 121. That is, we're, you know, we're adding a negative 121 value to the, to the cases. What's going on there? It may be there's a story. It may be that there's a particular policy of the prosecutor's office that explains that. But again, I might get a crime-by-crime crime breakdown, and it might prompt me to ask questions about our approach to certain crimes uh, across, all the, uh, across all the attorneys. So you might not stop with that. You might be asking questions along the lines that my colleague Ralph Peoples has asked over time, and that is what kinds of background environmental uh, concepts, uh, what kind of background or uh, individual characteristics of either the environment or the attorney himself or herself might explain the success. So rather than just asking how successful is the attorney, which is the question I've been asking, Ralph might be asking, why is a particular attorney more or less successful than another one? And we started uh, using a regression analysis uh, to try to answer that question. So Ralph will jump in on the why question. And I'm going to explain regression to you right now. <laughs> I am not. First of all, thank you for permitting an outsider to join you. Uh, this has been a great experience for me. My areas of interest usually are uh, dispute resolution, negotiation, and baseball. Uh, in no particular order, it depends on the season. But this area has been fascinating to me to take a look at, and I've always wanted to look at uh, negotiation on the plea bargaining side. What you have up here on this screen are a number of potential variables that might explain uh, an index score that Ron described. What we've seen with our runs so far, and I should explain that when we do runs, we're looking at more than 10,000, more than 10,000 convictions, dispositions. 
for, through one calendar year in 14 selected prosecutorial districts in North Carolina. Does gender matter? Does not appear to matter? Does race matter? And here we're talking about attorney characteristics. Does not appear to matter. Offense class does seem to matter. The giveaway for that is, you'll notice, under significance, it's marked in red. Anytime something's marked in red on a chart, you've got to pay attention. Highly significant. Offense class. Uh, suggesting that the more serious the offense uh, that a defendant is charged with, that's going to explain uh, what happens to that defendant prior record of the offender. Not so. <coughs> prosecutorial District 21. What you might ask is Prosecutorial District 21. It is where you don't want to be if you are a defendant. Prosecutorial District 21 happens to be uh, Ron and my home district. Uh, Forsyth County, uh, Wake Forest. Uh, difficult dispositions there, raising questions about what's going on. Initial supposition is tough DA, uh, difficult to bargain with, bears further inquiry. Years of experience. Here I need to expand a little bit. We were particularly interested in the relationship between the number of years experience of a defense counsel and outcomes. How is this defense counsel doing? Can we go back again? That finding on the chart is in red. It is not significant, but it's close enough that it bears further inquiry, which will be the next slide. Public, okay, let's do it. Oh, sorry? No, let's do it. <laughs> Experience and value added scores. This to me was a surprise. I don't know if it's a surprise to this audience because you know much more about criminal law and criminal procedure than I do. But what we found was that there seems to be a relatively short learning curve for defense counsel. Early out, you do better than you do after you've been at it for a while. Seven or more, why did we choose seven? Well, uh, that's biblical. That's how many years... Uh, Jacob had to be married to Leah before he got to marry Rachel. And it has a vague correlation uh, to how many years you have to generate income uh, as an associate for partners. Uh, and in some institutions, perhaps it has a relationship to how long you have to toil before you come up for tenure. But what we're seeing I did not expect. The numbers suggest, looking at index score, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, some improvement early in your career, and then a drop-off for the rest of your career. Now, you may be thinking these are just decimal points, uh, and we're talking hundreds here. We are. But please keep in mind, we're talking about more than 10,000 records, dispositions. And these numbers uh, may be telling a story. Why is it that early out of law school, in criminal defense, you seem to do much better than afterwards, after you've been at it for a while? 
curious story, and we will continue to investigate it. Okay. Finally, matchups. The gentleman in the corner, uh, I would say needs no introduction, but he probably does. Uh, Tony LaRusso, longtime manager of several Major League Baseball teams, uh, most recently the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, now retired. Tony La Russa is important for a number of reasons. First, he has a law degree. Second, when asked, mid-career, Tony, if you have a law degree, why do you put on a uniform and a cap and hang with young guys and just watch baseball games? Why not use your law degree? And Tony La Russa, looked off in the middle distance, vaguely towards the outfield, took a deep breath, and said, because there's a lot that goes on out there. There is a lot that goes on in a baseball game, but you have to know where to look. Tony was also an early adopter of the idea that numbers could tell a story, and numbers could lead you to what baseball people would call counterintuitive decisions, such as matchups. An index might make it possible for the manager of a public defender's office or a law firm to use matchups. This attorney in my office, seems to have a particularly good record when negotiating with this particular prosecutor or over this particular charge. That, to me, is analogous to what Tony La Russa was famous for, which was looking at his numbers and matching up his relief pitchers with how opposition batters had done against right-handers who throw mostly fastballs, left-handers who have nasty curves, etc. Picking the matchups. The index, if refined, might make matchups possible. And we'll wait for your questions about how one might use this and how we constructed it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, John Gross, and I'm Indigent Defense Counsel with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today, and one thing that I definitely take away from the last presentation is that um, I am never, under any circumstances, getting into some type of fantasy baseball league with either of you. <laughs> I finished last. <laughs> um, but I think um, the presentation that we just heard and one of the things, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, emphasizes something that um, as, as a representative of NACDL, a, an organization that very much wants to sort of advance the right to counsel, one of the things that I sort of butt heads with all the time uh, is the problem with sort of preaching to the choir. Uh, you all are the choir. Uh, I don't have to tell you how bad our current indigent defense systems are or the need of, for reform. Uh, and, and, but, but the problem is, is really sort of reaching that wider audience. How do you convince other folks, uh, legislators, other types of decision makers, that the system that we currently have is problematic? And, and how do we move that ball forward? So what I'm going to present to you today and, and what I did in preparation for this symposium was I wanted to really take a very hard look at indigency determination standards across the country in all 50 states. Uh, how are they done? What factors are considered? What are the cutoffs, et cetera? Um, and so what I'm really going to speak today about is um, 
the, that survey that I undertook and a proposal for a sort of new definition of being, quote, too poor to hire a lawyer. Because, and I want to emphasize at the start, um, again, as I mentioned, my title is Indigent Defense Counsel. Somewhere over the last 50 years, and somehow, this idea that being too poor to hire a lawyer somehow means indigency and how that term is used, those two concepts blended together. They are very different, uh, and, I, and I hope to be able to sort of demonstrate that to you today. So the first thing I'll point out is in the Federal Criminal Justice Act of 1964, uh, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, when he submitted that piece of legislation to the House, in the letter that he sent along with it, he explained that he didn't want to use the term indigency, that he thought that was an incorrect term and that that would simply breed confusion, that that would convey this idea that you had to be destitute to get counsel. And in fact, what he wanted to try to emphasize was that the issue really is that you are financially unable to obtain an adequate defense. And that idea, right, um, is a big part of Gideon. Right? The language in Gideon is, is that it's somebody who's too poor to hire a lawyer. It's not somebody who has no money. And some of the interesting decisions sort of around Gideon as well, Douglas v. California was already mentioned, which was decided with Gideon, which dealt about your right to counsel on, on appeal as of right. And in there, the court said there can be no equal justice when the kind of appeal a man enjoys depends on the amount of money he has. Right. So there's this sort of obvious idea that the criminal justice system shouldn't be about how much money you have, that you shouldn't be able to get a different result because you have more money than someone else, that there should be some type of standardized results no matter how much money you sort of throw at the case or throw at the problem. Um, but when it comes to a definition of indigency, we don't have one from the Supreme Court. Uh, the only time the court, certainly to my knowledge, has even sort of mentioned it was in Hardy v. U.S., which was a few years after this. And the mention comes, and again, that case was about obtaining a free trial transcript on appeal. And, and the potential definition of indigency that we get in that case comes from Justice Goldberg in a concurring opinion in a footnote, which, to my knowledge, has not been cited by the court at any point in time. And in that, the definition of indigency is, indigency must be conceived as a relative concept an impoverished accused is not necessarily one totally devoid of means. What that means is that when your lack of means substantially inhibits or prevents the proper assertion of a particular right or claim of right, you may be considered indigent. So when I read that definition, I'm sort of reminded of the Supreme Court's definition of uh, something pornography, right? Well, we know it when we see it, right? If you're really poor, you're really poor, and, well, We'll figure that out, right? I mean, everybody sort of knows what indigency is. And this idea that it shouldn't be about how much money you have. But then, let me give you this quote. You know, Fuller v. Oregon was the case that authorized recoupment from people, that you could get money back from a defendant who was convicted for the costs of their defense. Now, the court in the case, they did put some procedural limits on a state's ability to do that. But what I think is interesting is, is this language, right? The defendant in a criminal case who is just above the line separating the indigent from the non-indigent. So there's this acknowledgement that the court has already created this bifurcated system. In other words, check box, which I see on some forms in state. Is the defendant indigent? Yes or no? As if there was no gradation between those two things. As if either you're indigent and can't afford counsel or you're non-indigent and can afford an adequate defense, right? But what the court acknowledges is... In, in upholding the fact that you can recover money from someone who was, quote unquote, indigent for their defense, if, the, if they have it, that somebody who's not indigent must borrow money, sell off his meager assets, and call upon his friends and family in order to hire a lawyer. So in other words, the court acknowledges, if you're not indigent, but you're somehow slightly above that line, well, guess what you have to do, right? You have to basically become indigent in order to defend yourself. And I'll show you in a moment how states have sort of enacted that by statute across the country. Now, what do states typically rely on? Well, there's one standard that's pervasive throughout the country, and that standard is the federal poverty guidelines. 27 states use these. 
in some form or another, whether it's by statute, whether it's by administrative act, whether it's by court rule, all across the country. And I'll get to in a minute the states that don't have these type of specific standards, well, they may be worse in some ways because they have sort of no articulated standards at all about issues. Now, this is the current federal poverty guidelines, and let me just take a minute and tell folks how we got these. Um, how we got these is that there was an economist working for the Social Security Administration, Molly Orshansky, and she was tasked back in the 60s to come up with a method for measuring poverty. So here's what she did. Okay? She took the Agricultural Department's Household Food Consumption Survey, and from that determined that Americans spend one-third of their income on food. So that was her starting point. Then she calculated the Agricultural Department's economic food plan. In other words, the minimum amount of money that you could possibly spend on food and not starve. She got that dollar amount, decided that, well, people typically spend a third of their money on food. So if I take the bare amount of money that you can spend and not starve and multiply that by three, that's the poverty level. And since that time, it's only been adjusted for inflation. That's it. That's what this actually represents statistically. At the time, the Bureau of Labor Statistics had a separate survey that said, well, people only spend a quarter of their money on food, so maybe she could have multiplied it by a quarter. She decided not to do that. She admitted that this was a, a normative decision to multiply this by three. It was not based on any empirical data that she had. Um, there's no calculation of the consumer price index into this. There's no acknowledgement that food costs in the United States actually are some of the most stable and cheapest in the world. This is the number that states use. And obviously it goes without saying that this in absolutely no way reflects cost of legal services. Right? This is about having enough money not to starve. Now, there are a number, a, a plethora actually, of federal programs that use federal poverty guidelines in some way. National School Lunch, uh, 130%, you're eligible. 130% to 185, you get reduced price guidelines for food in school. SNAP, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, you become eligible for that, uh, around 130. WIC, right, 185 of the Federal Poverty Income Guidelines, you get WIC. Low Income Home Energy Assistance, 150. Uh, TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance in Needed Families, 185, right? So, let me show you what some of the states do for legal services. States that use these to determine eligibility, and these aren't all of the states, these are just the highlights or lowlights, depending on how you view this. Uh, these are the numbers that they use. Um, Virginia, where we are, you're never presumed eligible, you're only potentially eligible if you're below 125. Okay? Um, in Massachusetts, you've got to be below 125 to be presumed eligible. From 125 to 250, you might get counsel. Above 250, you have to show sort of extraordinary need. So you sort of get the idea here that, simply put, your child may be eligible for a reduced price school lunch, but you can't get assigned counsel. You may be eligible for WIC as a pregnant woman, but if you're charged with a crime, you apparently have enough money in many states to hire counsel. Um, the sort of insanity of this is something that has apparently gone unnoticed because I think to some degree indigent defense issues get put in a box, right? And they don't get seen as broader social issues. Now, the other side of this is states that, uh, whoops, go away, sorry. States where indigency is, quote unquote, impossible to determine, right? In Michigan, they've said it's not possible to set financial guidelines, right? Uh, in, in South Dakota, you can't use predetermined fiscal standards. Uh, in Utah, they describe this as a pasture where the trial judge is free to roam in making decisions about indigency. Uh, we can't have standards about this, right? Uh, in Indiana, and in Kentucky, the exact point in the economic scale which the defendant becomes indigent, therefore, until they have counsel furnished, is not subject to precise measurement, right? So you go from these two extremes. You make over 125% of the poverty, guy, of poverty income, you can't get counsel, to these states which basically say, well, we're going to let the trial judges decide. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, here's a thought. 
Uh, one of the reports for New York State concluded that in the, 80, in the 62 counties in New York State, there basically are no guidelines. And where there are guidelines, they're not enforced. In Texas, right, 254 counties, uh, 38 counties, you were eligible at 100 percent, 54 counties, right, at 125 percent, six counties at 150. So basically what this means is, as, as the quote from the report from New York State indicates, you can be in the same state, right, and depending on where you get arrested, your eligibility is going to change. And just another food for thought here, uh, four of the chief offenders in terms of organization of state structures, uh, states who use county-based systems or individual circuit court systems, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. If you added up the population of those four states, you get about 25 percent of the national population, right? And, and those, aren't the, those are just the sort of chief offenders there. All right. So what have states done? They've said there's a difference between being too poor to hire a lawyer. Uh, and indigent. So they declare you partially indigent. They declare you indigent but able to contribute. Marginally indigent, right? They use all of these terms to basically say, well, you're not indigent, but we know you can't afford counsel. So what we'll do is we'll charge you money, right? You have to pay a portion of your defense costs in some way. Now, one of the things that the ABA has advanced for a long time, right, is this idea consistent with the Supreme Court that Counsel should be provided to any person who is financially unable to obtain adequate representation without substantial hardship. Now, that's the sort of language that I focus on, and that in another case that the Supreme Court dealt with, which struck me, James V. Strange, which was actually striking down a recoupment statute, uh, as I recall, right? Or, I'm sorry, um, uh, upholding it but criticizing it, where they say that State recruitment laws, notwithstanding the state interest they serve, need not be a blight in such discriminatory fashion in hopes of indigence for self-sufficiency and respect, right? So that got me thinking. Well, if we have a standard, what should it be? So here's my sort of modest proposal. The self-sufficiency standards that are promulgated by the Center for Women's Wellness, which is, they do this in conjunction with the School of Social Work at the University of Washington, okay? And these measure a lot more than just how much food costs, right? These standards were developed actually as part of federal systems and programs that were meant to return women to the workforce. So they wanted to measure how much income did you need to actually be self-sufficient, right? And to me, if you're going to say counsel, you get counsel, it's going to be substantial hardship, well, you need to be self-sufficient, right? That's where the standards should be, if we're going to have one at all, all right? And they go by local and regional costs, they calculate how many children, et cetera. They use modern standards. Um, you know, one of the things that the federal poverty guidelines mentioned was they assumed a, uh, I, I forget the quote, but it's basically something that the woman of the house will be an efficient uh, shopper, et cetera. You know, this very dated 1950s language about home economics. Um, and it provides a realistic measurement of how much money you need to survive. So what would that look like in practice as I wrap up here? Well, the standards for Virginia were set, the last survey they did was in 2006, and so this is all in 2006 dollars. At the time, the federal poverty guidelines were $9,800. If you worked federal minimum wage, 40 hours a week, all year long, no breaks, you would earn $9,888, okay? Uh, the eligibility for assigned counsel based on Virginia's standard at that time, you would you were eligible if you made below uh, $12,250. And what were the self-sufficiency standards at the time here in Rockbridge County? $15,000. But if you looked at Alexandria, where I live, twenty-six. dollars okay? So the point being, the systemic use of the federal poverty guidelines throughout the country to establish indigency, right, warps the Supreme Court's original intent that counsel should be provided for anyone who is simply too poor to hire a lawyer. And going forward, I think it's incumbent upon advocates to bring this point up and say that this is a problem. And if we're going to suggest a different measure, then I would suggest if the standard is uh, financial hardship, we should be starting with a conversation about how much income is required to maintain a household to be financially self-sufficient. And the last two things I'll say is, one, this makes sense from a policy perspective, because basically 
if you're forcing people who can't afford to hire counsel to try to hire counsel, they're going to get one substandard counsel, and two, they're going to make themselves eligible for federal assistance because they will have lost all of their money and now need food stamps or WIC, et cetera. And two, in a system that values the presumption of innocence and we have the power of the prosecutor to charge people who may later be acquitted, doesn't it make more sense to set the bar a bit higher for assigned counsel than at this bare baseline of the federal poverty levels? So thank you. Thank you. Well, we have um, some time left for questions, comments, um, thoughts. And I thought I'll give the uh, first words to our uh, panelists if they want to question any of their uh, fellow panelists or make any um, comments. And if not, then of course it'll go uh, to the audience. I have a question for Josh. So you were talking to us about the different tasks that the that the pre-trial lawyer does and the trial defense mm -hmm. counsel. They have arguably fundamentally different jobs. And that plays out in the Supreme Court's recent cases in terms of defining the performance standards. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that might play out in either measuring prejudice differently or how the remedy might be different? Well, actually, I think it, it it's played out more on the prejudice prong insofar <coughs> as in Lafleur, uh, you know, so, so Fry could be narrowly cabined to just stand for the fact that if there's a formal off, uh, offer out there, you know, you can read it as a rule. If there's a formal offer out there, uh, a defense attorney has to convey it to his or her client. Um, that was the more interesting case because you're not dealing with, and this is uh, some of the stuff that Margaret was getting at, you're not dealing with a, a merely a formal offer, you're, you're dealing with a lack of a, a, a accurate, uh, or a lack of good advice um, uh, uh, to the defendant which caused the client to refuse to take a plea that was in his, his manifest best interest. The reason I say that the import of Lafleur is more about prejudice is because the court actually um, cabin the performance question to some degree. That is, the party stipulated right. that this was bad performance. And so kind of what I wish, you know, the part of me that wants to see how this is going to uh, uh, spin out, um, I, I wish the court had taken up uh, the performance question, and I guess that's a, something they will take up in the future. But the interesting thing about Laffler is, on the prejudice front, they said something profoundly different mm -hmm. than what they had said before in Hill, which is, um, uh, in the plea bargaining context, prejudice should be measured as a reasonable, pro uh, whether there was a reasonable probability that but for counsel's errors, um, the defendant would have uh, 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 turned down the plea and taken the case to trial. Of course, that's not the kind of prejudice that most pleading defendants are concerned about. What they say is, look, I was prepared to plead guilty. Um, maybe I am guilty. You know, accuracy is not the question. I just didn't get the benefit that other people get in the ordinary course. I wanted the same benefit. I wanted the same good deal. I wanted the same good way around, or, or not good way, but best way available around um, what the code law prescribed, around what I would have gotten at trial. And the court on the prejudice prong actually does entertain that here. They say, look, what we said in Hill is merely one way of showing prejudice. One way of showing prejudice is that there's a reasonable probability that you would have otherwise taken your case um, uh, 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 to trial. Another way of showing prejudice is to show, I, but for counsel's errors, I, there's a reasonable probability I would have gotten a better deal. And actually, Jenny is, uh, wrote a, a brilliant piece about prejudice um, in the context of Padilla and whether Padilla had begun to open this door to uh, the door to a change in the court's vision of prejudice. And I think her inclinations were borne out by what the court did in Laffler. So I, I think that's where most of the work is being done mm -hmm. so far, or most of the definitive work has been done, um, is on the prejudice prong. Uh, Don, and then Jenny. I have uh, two quick ones. One friendly comment for Josh, and a fairly unfriendly comment for Ron and Ralph. Um, <laughs> you know, we're now, when Laffler and, 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 and Fry say it, we're now openly saying that the plea process is, is not designed to approximate trial outcomes. It's designed to avoid trial outcomes. And so that nature of a lawless system mediated by uh, official discretion <coughs> seems to us completely alien, but it ought to sound familiar because that's exactly what the founding era criminal justice system was. All the felonies were capital. Um, in England, which is more sanguinary than the U.S., 
They have 200 capital crimes that are on the turn of the 19th, 18th and the 19th century. They have 200 capital offenses and 50 executions. There are even fewer executions in America. The way that was mediated was by hyper-technical pleading requirements that the judges had discretion to find or not, jury nullification, um, benefit of clergy, and a system in which executive clemency was institutionalized and made a, an official, open, regular part of the system. So, so I think that's a, you know, I think that's a friendly amendment or a friendly comment. On, uh, on, that, on that front. Now, round and round, I mean, the follow-up to Moneyball was that the big market teams adopted the metrics used by um, uh, uh, the Open Athletics, uh, and as a result, the Yankees and the Dodgers uh, and so forth um, became much better teams by using those same metrics. Are you comfortable with the notion of prosecutors using the amount of time served as a metric for their effectiveness? Um, no. So. I, when I go to prosecutors' offices and ask them, how are you measuring your prosecutors? If they say we got metrics, I'm interested. I'm not as necessarily worried. But if they say, uh, if I lose the case, I'm rated down, this is a profoundly broken office. This is a big problem if you're rating your prosecutors based on whether they win or lose their cases. So. Because of because the nature of the prosecutor's work is more multivariate, is, is more multifaceted, um, I'm not opposed to uh, to metrics for the prosecutor, but metrics that are one factor, such as how much do you increase the pun punishment, really does not uh, does not adequately describe the the, uh, the the obligations of the prosecutor to the public. So I'm, I would be worried about a simple metric for a prosecutor's office in a way that I wouldn't worry about the, a, a simpler metric for uh, defense counsel who, at least in some settings, could have a very straightforward, reduce the harm kind of mission. Don, let me just say that I really appreciate that friendly comment, especially because I've, I've long been kind of intrigued by the art of circumventing law, and I actually wrote something about um, mandatory capital punishment under the bloody code and the way in which uh, 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 all the actors, uh, juries especially, would end run it. And um, you know, I, I compared it to modern life without parole as a mandatory sentence and that there are fewer opportunities um, uh, to end run mandatory life without parole under the current system. And I just hadn't thought to draw the same connection uh, between plea bargaining uh, uh, after Lafleur and Fry and mandatory capital punishment uh, at common law, so I appreciate that. To yes, Jenny. Um, thanks for reading my article. <laughs> um, so I want to go. I want to follow up on that because, of course, I was really interested in what the court did in Lafleur um, and in Fry on prejudice. And like you, I was a little disappointed that they didn't engage in the first prong, but I guess when the state concedes, they concede, and how could they not concede in that case? Um, but in some ways, that would have only gotten you to the question, which is a really important one, the kind of reverse to the question of whether there's ineffective assistance for sort of failing to um, advise, urge, along the steep side of the spectrum of what a lawyer is constitutionally required to do, um, your client about the dangers of turning down the plea. Um, and I guess I have a more basic question on prong one, um, and sorry to Ron and Stephen who have already heard me ask this question, um, which is what about the constitutional prong one, putting aside prejudice for a second, duty to effectively bargain? I mean, that would have been a really fascinating question, which really wasn't even an issue in Lafleur. Is there a duty to be an effective bargainer. And I feel there's a lot of good language in the decisions about that that you could use in support of that argument. We're no, by no means there yet. Um, and I guess an, I'll give you an example, which would be you know, the lawyer um, defense counsel is in a jurisdiction where, to put prejudice aside, I'll just say, it is reasonably likely the prosecutor would have agreed to this deal. So we can put that, on the, you know, put that aside. And, and they, they go to their client and they say, here's the offer, it's one year in jail for X. This will make you deportable with no discretionary avenues for relief. They could have gotten 364 days and then there would have been an avenue for relief, but they didn't take that extra step in bargaining and saying, just one day less, please, and, and where they would have gotten it. What does the court do then? So, I mean, I agree with you. The, there's a lot, there's great rhetoric 
that indicates that there is a constitutional right to effective bargaining. But um, because certain questions are cabin, the court doesn't quite get to that. Scalia uh, takes the court to prescribe this novel uh, constitutional right to uh, effective bargaining. He thinks that's an awful thing. Um, I agree with him descriptively that this is what I think the court is doing. I don't take it to be an awful thing. I take it to be a good thing. Um, uh, so I think it, 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 there's, a, there's a lot that's left up in the air. There's a lot. So I mean, we can think about what, what does a right to effective bargaining in terms of performance even mean? Um, does it mean that uh, the, defend, the, the council has an obligation to exercise reasonable persuasion with respect to the client, um, to bring the client to see the light that they should plead out? Um, does it require uh, a, a, a counsel to push the prosecutor to offer a defense favorable plea where that in the ordinary course in that courthouse uh, a defense favorable plea uh, uh, could be available there's reason uh, that it could be available on the particular charge um, how hard does the prosecutor does a defense attorney need to push the prosecutor or his or her client and you know it's not all upside it's not all good stuff because you know, I, I, I mean, I, I pointed, I focused a little more on the bad side of, or the potential bad side of Laffer and Fry in a short essay um, for the Federal Sentencing Reporter, where I actually said, look, you know, one way to read this is that it, it, the, the, the stronger the obligation on the defense attorney, the more a prosecutor can constitutionally enlist a defense attorney to get the defendant to plead guilty, you know, and, and, Maybe uh, the defendant is pleading guilty in a way that's in his or her manifest best interest as compared to the trial course, but it's a little disturbing um, the degree to which uh, uh, Laffler, Fry, and Padilla fit into the larger, uh, the court's larger uh, guilty plea jurisprudence where whether the prosecution wins in a discrete case or whether the defendant wins in, the pre, uh, in a discrete case, the edifice of plea bargaining kind of always wins. It always becomes sort of easier to, to plead guilty in the, in the future. It becomes more efficient. It becomes the thing that the defendant is uh, 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 pushed towards doing more and more and more. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that's wholly responsive, but uh, hopefully it's a little bit. Uh, you've had your hand up quite a while. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure who you were pointing at. Um, my question is for Ron and Ralph. I, I thought this was really fascinating and the presentation was great. I'm super intrigued by this number of years in experience uh, correlation and in particular the, the negative correlation. So I'm wondering if you could just give us, I know you said it's preliminary, but um, as I saw those numbers, I was thinking, I mean, there's a cynical take on that, right, which is that there's some kind of fatigue factor element going on. But then there's a more um, maybe uh, less cynical take, which is that is it just uh, that's reflective of the fact that the longer someone's in, uh, has experience, we give them more cases, we give them harder cases, and so their outcomes are going to be. Anyway, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on that. I had a huge advantage when I began looking at these numbers. I had no idea what was normal and not normal. So I could just look and say, oh, that's odd. And years of experience did surprise me. Wow. You know, if you curved it based on the chart we showed you, it would be like a ski jump. One of the areas that I want to look at is exactly what you're describing, which is, okay, if that's true, that there seems to be this fall off, why? Uh, one possibility is what you suggested, I think, that with experience comes harder cases, right? All of a sudden, you're getting the defendants uh, who are charged higher and who have priors. That's a possibility. Another possibility that I need to think about a little bit more is self-selection. 
one thing that struck me when I looked at the numbers was how many people straight out of law school do this and do it a lot. We were only looking at high volume defense attorneys. And it struck me how many of our attorneys were less than three years out. Right? It may be that criminal defense is used as a proving ground to move <coughs> on to other areas of practice later on. And if you're looking to make a name, you do it. But then you move on to something else that's less taxing. Does that make any? I have no idea. I'm speculating. And, and let me follow up with one further observation. I suspect that it's not case volume and that it's not offense seriousness. Because when we were running the regression, we controlled for mm -hmm. offense class. And we controlled for number of cases that this person <laughs> put through the system. Controlling for that, we were still getting something negative going on with the experience. The, the, the trouble with the, the static going on is that it's not just a straight line. Like for every year that you're in the system, you get a little bit worse. Um, it, it's more like for a while you get a little bit better, and then we know that after about seven years, the better kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. And typically the people who have been at it, we had people who were, had been at it for more than 40 years. And the folks who were at it for more than 40 years were not producing especially good scores. So, so it's not a very clean downward line. It kind of bounces around some. But I would say we're already controlling for offense class, and we're already controlling for volume of cases. So it, I'm, I, I'm doubtful that that's the explanation for the, for the finding. There are lots of hands up, and I realize we're well uh, beyond the time. I think what would be good is to get the questions on the table um, and then perhaps see how much time we have left um, and then maybe leave it to lunch discussion. But I think we would all be enriched if we heard the questions and the comments. Um, I heard Erica, I saw Erica, Brandon, um, Stephanos, and I think just went up uh, Robin's and Sasha's hands. Um, Erica, if you want to start, and then Brandon, Stephanos, Robin, and Sasha. So we can at least get the questions out. Very quickly. Um, so this was actually going to be directed at Ron and Ralph also. Um, I, I was interested in your... Can I, can I just say for a minute? I'm going to anyway. <laughs> I'm the father of four children. I'm used to being disagreed with. I did felony time as an associate dean. I'm used to being disagreed with. Criticism does not bother me. <laughs> I'm not sure I was interviewing it critical or not, but, um, no, but I'm I, just, I was disappointed when Don said he had something unfriendly for Ron and me. And I thought, that's it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the, the one thing that troubles I think this is a really interesting project. The one thing that really troubles me is the assessment of individual attorneys uh, based on the metric you developed. And I guess my concern is. Ron described the prosecutors as having a much more multifaceted role. Um, I think what makes the defense counsel's goal so multifaceted is that every client is different. And so I think that there are certainly clients who want to uh, mitigate sentence. Um, there are other clients who want to go to trial um, and who feel like they're not going to take a plea. And what I worry about is that this really does uh, reward reward counsel who can get their client to plead guilty if there's a good plea offer on the table. Um, right. and, and I think that's really problematic if you are, if you're saying this attorney is not doing a good job because they are going to trial more often and they're losing and, 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 and they could have gotten this plea discount um, and therefore we should be judging them in some way. So that was, that's my concern. <coughs> I want to connect to this morning's panel and ask, you know, for, for, also for Ron and Ralph, why, why wouldn't you include as part of the score what collateral consequences attach to the convictions? Because obviously yeah. the lawyer gets a better result than the, uh, 
you know, lawyer over here who got a year for the client, and the lawyer got two years but not deportation or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'd think that that would be a really important mm -hmm. part of the score. And then Josh can't answer, and obviously we don't have time, but I, but I, but I wanted to hear Josh respond to the paper and ask whether, well, you just reduce the, uh, the Strickland analysis after a lot more to the numbers, you know, quantify. Uh, uh, we, we now know what it all means, what unreasonable performance of is. And, um, <laughs> so so you, can, you can do that in your paper. <laughs> so I just wanted to build on Kara's point. Number one, I'd be interested, you're taking a snapshot of all the current people with the current levels of experience. Find a way to match same attorney in 2007 versus 2012, because there probably is some beneficial experience, but also some slackening of effort, and I'm interested where the lines cross. And it's also possible not only are people cashing in after you know, like three, five, seven years of experience to, to pay off debts and they're having kids and other stuff, but also what good ones are remaining may be kicked upstairs to become supervisors who are not carrying their own caseloads. And that's also going to complicate the analysis. Okay. So you have a whole bunch of lines of explanation going together here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say um, to Ralph and Ron, I, I love your project, and and as a defender manager, I find it incredibly helpful to think about. I just wanted to sort of throw out two things. If I had to posit, just having been a defender manager for so long, as to what happens, um, I don't actually think it's burnout. I think it's probably that. The impact of culture, which is that culture of the courthouse, begins to take people over. I mean, I'm a very, and I see, and you see it in the police department, you see it in the prosecutor's offices. I'm a very big believer in the impact that culture will ultimately have over the individual, no matter how hard you try to swim upstream. And so, if you're that young public defender trying to swim upstream against all the pressures to begin to engage in bad practice and lazy practice, um, that you eventually run out of that scene. Um, and I think culture may take you over at that point. So it's just some, I don't know how you measure that, but I think culture has a huge impact um, on the police as well. Um, the only other thing I would say about, and, and I know you were careful not to say in your presentation, which I actually appreciate <laughs> that defender managers may have other things they want to measure. But the thing that, that the only thing that, that I would think about seriously about that is that there's no client voice or experience in the analysis you're doing. And as an office that does client satisfaction surveys every two years, right, yeah. we measure sort of client's experience of the representation. And what we find over and over again is that the way they rate the experience they've had is almost never related to case outcome. That doesn't mean case outcome is not important, mm -hmm. but it means that from the perspective of the people who are getting the defender services, yeah. their experience of that and the process and the procedural process is really important and I think should be in the measure of effective representation. Um, because it may be that sometimes to clients the process is more important than the case outcome. And I, I'd be nice to measure that. Uh, so just, uh, Erica made the bulk of my point in the same <laughs> reaction. So I, I just want to emphasize, I hear a resonance between uh, that metric and an interpretation I'm hearing of Laffler, which is, I don't want to call it an uncritical acceptance, but a sort of comfortable acceptance of this idea that the market rate for an offense should be a metric of something. Um, and I think, and Stefano, you, you, you explained this in your paper, and we'll get, we'll get to talk about it later, but the market rate for an offense is a reflection of charging decisions. And so in effect, if you make up the measure of defense effectiveness, and good outcomes were essentially validating charging decisions. And, and I feel like Eric and Robin are pushing back and saying that's not, first of all, this shouldn't be the metric. And second of all, that's what defense counsel are for. And also, the, the, I think the client piece is really important because we, we don't think that process is only supposed to be about validating the decision that the prosecutor's office may charge a particular thing or not. And I'm afraid that, that, um, that the market rate is too narrow a way of measuring what we think outcomes should look like. I mean, I'll just say in 10 seconds, you just articulated much better. Um, my hesitation, my, my, my resistance to Laffler, even though I welcome a lot of the rhetoric there, it's the fact that in recognizing that law is made by practice, the person who dominates practice is the prosecutor. 
So it's really laws made by prosecutors. So there's a danger there, and I think you put your finger right on it. Any other 10-second response, Ron, Ralph, John? No, I'm glad Ron's taking notes. <laughs> well, then, let me thank not just the panelists, who were obviously fabulous, uh, but all of you for this great conversation.